A record-breaking week in the NBA. The Masters has a new champion. Phil Simms blindsided? Brooke Lopez cracks a major milestone. And we have an interview with Kim Hampton. All that and more on What's the 411 Sports. Coming right up. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 411 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, it's good to see you as always. Yep, you too, Keisha. And it's good to see you guys. So it was a record-breaking week in the NBA. We have Brooke Lopez, who we'll talk about a little later. He broke a record, but also Russell Westbrook from OKC. He broke Oscar Robinson's 55-year-old record of 41 triple-doubles in a single season. Russell Westbrook scored number 42 of his triple doubles against the Denver Nuggets. And in the win, Westbrook scored 50 points, had 15 rebounds and 10 assists, knocking the Nuggets out of playoff contention. And for those who don't know what a triple double is, it's when a player scores double digits in three different categories. So Mike, with Russell Westbrook now having the record for most triple doubles in a season and on the verge of averaging a triple double for a season, does this lock give him the runaway for the MVP trophy? If so, why? If not, why? <laughs> In my book, he does, Keisha. I thought it was so fitting for him to get that buzzer beater to knock the Nuggets out of the playoffs over the past weekend. Russell Westbrook has been sensational all season long. And, of course, you pointed out to this miraculous record-breaking season that he's had. I don't want to belittle what James Harden has done in Houston at all. James Harden has had, has had a terrific year. But for me, after losing Kevin Durant, who is arguably – he and Russell Westbrook were neck and neck as the best player on OKC. Russell Westbrook, I know that they don't have nearly as many wins as the Houston Rockets do. But for me, Russell Westbrook is my MVP. And I will say this. If you look at the West Western Conference standings right now and the way the playoffs are shaping out, who's going to meet up? OKC and Houston is the 3-6 matchup in the playoffs, so it'll be interesting to see those two duke it out. Yeah, I think I had Russell Westbrook winning MVP before the record-breaking performance in Denver, and I still have him as my MVP now. I think, you know, James Harden, you, you can really make a case for him as well, but I just, I think when you average a triple-double, that says a lot, and he's doing it and his team is winning. It's not like the, the Thunder are losing and he's just racking up all these statistics and all these records. He's actually helping his team to win. So I think that's important. And when, when they lost Kevin Durant, nobody thought that the Thunder would make the playoffs, much less a 60. Maybe if people thought they would make the playoffs, they would just, you know, eat right in there. But they're a solid number six at this point. So I definitely give Westbrook the nod for MVP. So, Keisha, we go to Augusta, Georgia from the past weekend. Sergio Garcia is the bridesmaid no longer. The 37-year-old broke through, finally winning a major title by holding off Justin Rose just in the nick of time in a thrilling finish to the Masters. Keisha, what was your take over the weekend on Garcia capturing that elusive green jacket? Well, Mike, I'm going to be honest. Can we be honest, friends? I am definitely part of the Tiger Woods effect. <laughs> Because when Tiger is not in golf, I don't really pay as much attention. So, but I did, you know, catch the news and when he finally, Sergio Garcia, right? Finally won his first Masters. I was happy for him. So we go from golf where somebody won their first Masters and we talked to about football where somebody has just hung up their cleats. And we're going to talk about Tony Romo, the former Dallas Cowboy. Tony Romo is officially retired, and he is taking his talents into the broadcast booth with CBS with uh, Jim Nance. Now that he is done with football, so we think, what do you think is Romo's place in history? Is he a Hall of Famer? Will he be in the Dallas Ring of Honor? What kind of broadcaster would he be? What do you think about Tony Romo, his legacy, and his future? Keisha, with two playoff wins and some injury-plagued seasons towards the later stages of his career, I don't think that Tony Romo stacks up as a Hall of Fame player. Without question, he belongs in the Dallas Cowboy Ring of Honor. No doubt about that. The guy came out of Eastern Illinois undrafted. No one expected him to get to where he got to. 
And he had a very good career. And that's not easy for me being a Giant fan because I've rooted against Tony Romo throughout his whole career. But you got to give respect where it's given. And I do give it to Tony Romo. I think he's had a very good career. I would say for right now, no Hall of Fame, but definitely he belongs in the Ring of Honor. And as far as his commentating ability and what's going to happen, really only time will tell. I think that you know CBS really made a bold move by axing Phil Simms and bringing Romo in. I think it will be interesting to see how it all plays out once the season starts next year. Yeah, I'm with you. I think... I think Tony Romo was very good at his job. I don't think that he is a Hall of Famer. And unfortunately for him, he came in a time where a lot of his contemporaries are really just outstanding. He's in the same age and uh, playing group with Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Peyton Manning, Eli Manning, Ben Roethlisberger. And when you look at what they've accomplished and you put it in, we all agree that Brady is a, a first ballot Hall of Fame. Peyton, when it's his time, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Maybe Ben and Drew Brees. And when you put Tony Romo against them, he doesn't, he doesn't stack up. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. As I mentioned earlier in the show, Brooke Lopez, our hometown hero, has now become the Nets franchise all time leading scorer. The Nets wrapped up their final home game against the Chicago Bulls, beating the Bulls by 107 to 106. Brooke Lopez was struggled offensively in that game, but he came back and dropped his 10,000. 444th point against the Boston Celtics on the road. It took nine seasons, 562 games, but Lopez got the record. It wasn't easy to do. His Buck Williams record stood pat for 28 years. But let's take a little closer look at our hometown hero, Brooke Lopez, with some little fun facts. Mike and friends, he has a brother, twin brother, Robin, who plays for the Chicago Bulls. Brooke Lopez is an avid comic book reader, and that started when he was a kid, and he and Robin used to take the older brother's comic books to read and then draw. Sports runs in the family. His mother was a world-class swimmer, and he had an uncle that pitched in Major League Baseball. Don't go away, because when we return, we will have former WNBA New York Liberty Center, Kim Hampton. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. We'd like to welcome Kim Hampton to the show. Welcome, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. And we are really excited to have you on the show. And for those of you who don't know, Kim was in the first ever WNBA game. You were, at, like, groundbreaking. You were part of history. <laughs> I'd say so. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kim, I wanted to ask you, you started basketball at a relatively late age in comparison to most professional athletes. How were you introduced to basketball, and when did you know that you wanted to take it further? Well, <laughs> when I was a freshman in high school, I was six feet tall at the time, and the first day of school, this little man runs up to me, you got to play basketball, right? you got to play basketball. <laughs> it was the high school coach, and he asked, and, and because I had never played and I already felt goofy and tall and I just didn't want to do anything that I didn't, you know, know how to do and was going to make me feel any more goofy and tall than I already was. So I told him no, but until it was probably four days before the actual tryouts that I told him I would try out for the team. And I always say that that was the day that kind of changed my life, the trajectory of my life. Uh, I realized that I wanted to take it serious and I realized I wanted to go to college on a scholarship I would say my sophomore year because I had developed I had started developing and I could see the light at the end of the tunnel kind of like oh I'm yeah. gonna be good at this you know yeah. so and that's when I started setting some goals you know I want to go to college on a scholarship I want to get out of Louisville I don't want to go to Kentucky I don't want to go you know I just want to <laughs> see some things so yeah that's how I felt when I went to college. I wanted to get out of my home state and just go. Yeah. <laughs> Mike? As a, young, as a young teenager playing basketball, were there any athletes that you looked up to? Well, when I grew up in high school, well, see, you guys are kids, but <laughs> well, I graduated from high school in 80, 1980, yeah. So uh, women's basketball wasn't big. It wasn't what it is today. As a matter of fact, um, it was still AIAW. It hadn't gone NCAA yet. And women's basketball wasn't played on television, so I didn't know what school to go to. 
Um, so I didn't have female role models to look up to. Um, you know, we didn't hardly see the, the Olympic team or anything like that. So my, the, the role models that I had were the NBA players and like Moses Malone, he was a left-hander. And so, you know, he was a good rebounder and he played well around the basket. You know, some of those players, Dr. J and those guys. So those were the, some of the players that I looked up to. And in terms of um, choosing your school, where did you, in terms of college, what was your deciding factor? What were some of your ideas? Do you really want to know? <laughs> yes, yes, I the chose, viewers want to know. <laughs> I chose Arizona State because the weather was warm and the campus was beautiful. How about that? <laughs> that yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, but, but, but because we were not NCAA, I, that means I couldn't take, a, well, well, I couldn't take paid official visits because... My parents weren't going to pay for me to go to the University of Hawaii or pay for me to go to two or three schools in California and pay for me to travel across the country to make my mind up. So I, the, the schools that were far, I pretty much had to go off of speaking to the coaches, some of the, the players and, you know, and things like that. Them sending me brochures and looking at it, looking at the academia, you know, and things like that. But it was just something about Arizona State that just stood out. I mean, I can't even... I can't tell you what it was, <laughs> but I guess it was where I was supposed to be. Yeah. Warm weather is very seducing. I am, by the way. <laughs> yeah. After college, what was it like being in your early 20s to mid-20s where there is no professional bas women's basketball league in America, but then you have an opportunity to go play overseas? Was that a big culture shock for you? Um, yes and no. Um, I I was, I've always been adventurous and just wanted to go and see the world and travel. That's why I left Louisville, Kentucky, which is my hometown, to go, you know, to Arizona. And so I just kind of wanted to keep growing. Um, I wanted to, I got a chance when I was in college to play, to, uh, to represent the USA and to play, you know, in the Goodwill Games, you know, and things like that. So I got a taste of that and I knew that I could play professional ball abroad. So I was ready for it. I wanted to go. I was, yeah. And I played my first six years in Spain. Y si yo hablo español también, si yo puedo hablar con vosotros en español si queréis, sin problema. Excelente. Aunque he jugado para el en Italia por cuatro años y medio. Ah, qué buena, buena. Y luego he jugado un año en Japón y luego un año en Francia también. Y fue just amazing. I mean, I still have friends and former teammates that come and visit me to today, you know, um, come here to New York. And so it's just awesome. That's amazing. So kind of piggybacking a little bit off of Mike's question, when you graduated from college, there was no WNBA. Mm -hmm. And you had your male counterparts who had an opportunity to stay within the United States and play. Mm -hmm. What was your feelings about that? Did you have any feelings in, in that in order for you to play professionally that you needed to go overseas? Well, you know, us as women have always taken the back seat to men in sports. You know, it just is what it is. <laughs> you know, but anyway. <laughs> you know, so I knew that eventually um, a professional league for women would happen. I just didn't think that it would be in my era or my time when I was playing. But I, I just knew that it would happen. So, I mean, all we had was what we had. And, and you know, I wasn't making waves of it. I was just looking for the opportunity to do it. And when you got the the notice, I don't know how you were notified that the WNBA was established. What was your feelings then? Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you the story. Um, actually, the ABL started first. It started before the WNBA. You had the '96 Olympic team, and you had you know it was it was Lisa Leslie, Cheryl Swoops, um, you know Ruthie Bolton, Rebecca Lobo. You had all of these players that were there. So the ABL started at the end of that. At, well, it started um, at, at right after the Olympics. You know that the end of our um, the end of our term in Europe. So it started early, and I can remember they them approaching me. Some of the players. It was one of the players that she was kind of acting as an agent as well. And she says, "Kim, we're starting a professional league in America. You know, we're offering six figures for salaries and stuff." And so I immediately called my agent. And I was like, "Hey, you know, I was like Bruce. You know, they're talking about this league, ABL." He's like, "Nope, nope, don't sign anything." He said, "I know that they're starting that." I was like, "Well, why?" I was like, "We can play in America. It's going to be played, you know, during the summer." He was like, "No." He said. 
Okay, he said, the NBA is going to be starting a league, and you're going to play in that one. I said, the NBA is going to start a professional league? He's like, yeah, they're going to play in NBA arenas. He said, it's going to be much bigger. It's going to be, so that's what you're waiting on. And I was like, are you sure? And he was like, yeah. He was like, really? <laughs> and so what happened was, in the interim, while all of this was happening, we were still in Europe, they sent a scout, Renee Brown, um, uh, they sent a scout over to Europe to visit these countries where players like myself, Cynthia Cooper, Teresa Weatherspoon, Sue Wicks, have been playing for many years, you know, to just see all of the players. And what they decided to do was to have an elite draft. So they chose 32 players uh, that have been playing in Europe. And um, uh, I happen to be one of those 32 players. So the first two players, they decided, it was eight teams that started, and they decided to place two players on each team preferably close to you know where they went to school like lisa leslie went to U usc so she is in la mm -hmm. rebecca lovell yukon so they put her in new york um you know and things like that um and then the second two players they drafted so i was drafted um, I was um, the third player on the New York Liberty team. I was drafted in the first round, and New York had the fourth pick, so I was the fourth fourth pick to come and play for the New York Liberty. And, I, you know, I didn't know what to expect, but I can just remember my teammate in Italy at the time, she had been drafted. She was in the elite, you know, and went to Cleveland, and I heard her teammate and her roster, and I was like, oh, man, I want to go to Cleveland. I want to play in Cleveland. <laughs> I didn't even understand, you know, like yeah. what, what playing in a market like New York can do for you for your life and career. I mean, I'm still here, and it's just amazing. So it was such a blessing, you know, that I got uh, selected yeah. and drafted to play for New York. That's awesome. Yeah, that was 21 years ago. Good thing you How listened to that? Bruce, huh? I know. Well, <laughs> I know, and I'm, and I'm just so proud that the league is still going on. You know, they, we're kicking off the 21st season. Of the WNBA, May 13th, the New York Liberty. You That's know. awesome. Yeah. Can you take me back to that first game? Oh. What your feelings were at that moment? Mm -hmm. uh, it was just an emotional roller coaster at the time because I can remember us, you know, being dressed. Oh, well, first of all, both, you know, we, we flew out to L.A., it was before the game. We flew out a week early because we had, it was the first game, you know, it was New York against LA, you know, it was the big media hype. CBS was covering it. You know, Nike was the sponsor. So it was just, it was huge. And we had media um, appearances and all, all week long. So, you know, it was just a really busy and hectic time. But when we finally got on the bus and we rode down underneath the Great Western Forum, and then we, when we were getting off, it was like paparazzi. It was just crazy. I mean, like it had to have been like 100 people from the media as we got off the bus and we went in the locker room and I was just sitting there thinking, I just picked a stall and I was sitting there like this. I was like, oh my God, you think of all the history, like we have finally made it. And I had tears in my eyes because it was just like, I, you know, I thought that I figured that they would have it, but I just didn't think again that I would be a part of it. And I was just thinking, oh my gosh, we are making history. We're getting ready to make history. You know, and, and I think about it and I still get teary and, you know, and I, and I, and then I, I got up and I was like, man, I wonder how, what great players sit in this seat. You know, Bob Cousy, my, you know, Michael Jordan. So I went and made sure I rubbed my butt in every <laughs> stall. <laughs> in every stall, I was like, okay, let me get some of that. Yeah, Moses Malone, let me get some of that. And I just started naming, you know. So yeah. I was, and then uh, <clears throat> both teams were super nervous. We got out on the court. Lisa Leslie and I were blessed and fortunate to do the first ever jump ball. We had to do a ceremonial tip off first, and then we did the official, you know, uh, jump ball. And gosh, I scored the first two points for the New York Liberty. Penny Toller scored the first two points of the WNBA. Um, I took the first shot, but I missed. <laughs> <laughs> but I came back and scored the first two points. And, you know, it was just, um, you know, and, and here we are 21 years later. It's just, and the, and the talent is just incredible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, looking at the, N the WNBA now, mm -hmm. what are some of the obstacles that you see in terms of having this, you know, reaching some of the same popularity and numbers in terms of the NBA, and do you think those issues are being addressed properly? Well, um, you know, it's just so different. When, when you talk about the NBA and you talk about the WNBA, it's two different animals because the NBA, they breed one, who's the superstar, who's the next superstar. Um, all of the rules dictate offense because they're like, it's, it's about spectacularism. You know, they're not, you can't hand check, you can't do anything. I mean, you think back to the bad boys when they oh, played man. against, you know, those brawls <laughs> yes. and things like that. Yes. You know, no one, who, I, I mean, 
every week somebody scoring 50 points like that just would not happen that often back in the day you know so um you know i was watching one of the sports shows and they were talking about you know athletes you know being better i believe yes players have evolved we're faster quicker stronger with the technology we we eat different you know i mean we there's so much yes so i believe that athletes are definitely superior but i believe too the rule changes of the game have made it a lot different so for the men you know, it's 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 a money thing, you know, and and I think that's what it is for women because we're not making that type of money. We don't have the sponsorships, you know, you know, and things, and people aren't into it. We still play below the rim. There are some players that can dunk, but we play below the rim. It's more team oriented, you know, and things like that. So it's just a little different, and it just depends on what you like. If you like spectacular, you know, corporate America loves spectacular. You know, all the celebrities want to go and be seen in court side, you know, or if you are a true, you know, basketball fan, then. You know, it's the WNBA because they have amazing players. They're athletic. Um, they play team ball. You know, so it just it's just really different. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. One of the things I've noticed with the WNBA is that it hasn't gotten as much exposure. But I think one thing that ESPN can do and some of the other networks is market it a little bit differently to get some more eyeballs up. You look at this past women's basketball tournament with UConn going out. I think a lot of people are sort of down on women's college basketball because UConn has dominated for so long. Yeah. For me, though, watching them lose in the Final Four the way that they did, I think it adds to a little bit more excitement coming into next season. Do you agree with that? That With yeah. with UConn losing the way they did, that people will possibly be more engaged watching women's basketball next year? Yeah, but I, I, to me, though, I just don't think I, I don't think it should be it should be dependent upon whether UConn wins or loses or that they're dominant. I really think that that every program every individual that plays should 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 really put effort in and focus on what they could do to get better to to compete against a UConn. Guess what? Gino has the opportunity to get the best players in the in the in the world. You know, I mean um, he can. But you you take don't take away the fact and don't forget that he pushes those players mentally and physically harder than probably most programs. You know, if you want that for, I heard, if you want cushy feeling like you're doing a great job, Mike, <laughs> you know, I'm proud of you. You know, you're right. not getting that from Gino, you know, yeah, from exactly. what they say, you know. But he's building character. He's building strength, you know, just so that you can be prepared in these situations. But they're going to be like anyone else. They're, they're going to have great recruiting seasons, you know, and then they're going to have some lulls where they're not. And that's what it was. But, you know, so I just I think our focus is wrong. You know, I think I think the focus I think more kids, you know, everyone's dream. I want to go to UConn. I want to go to UConn now, you know, with Dawn, you know, yes, yeah, some players, you don't want to diversify or you might have, you know, players in Maryland, you know, Maryland is really big. So some players want to stay home, you know, and things like that. But I think players should challenge themselves to want to go to other programs to make other programs to build other programs up. I think coaches should challenge themselves to really learn to utilize, you know, the talent that they have and to improve on decision making, improve on people skills, you know, and things like that. You know, I just, you know, UConn is going to be UConn, you know, but they but they're like everyone else. They can be beat. And and the funny thing about it is. I told everyone, they're just not used to being in that situation. They're not used to close games. So if you notice, when it was close down towards the end, they started missing free throws, just like everybody who played, you know. They, uh, they missed layups, you know. Uh, they got scored on. They made turnovers, you know, and things like that. It's just that they are so comfortable because they, they are used to play hard. Points. They're winning by 30 <laughs> points. They're never in a pressure situation. Right. So, yeah. So I was wondering if maybe we could just touch a little bit on life after basketball for you. Sure. How you made that transition. And <clears throat> ladies, she's got beautiful skin. So maybe I can get her to give us some of her beauty tips on how we can get skin just like hers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, life after basketball, I've always had... Like when I was a little girl, I always wanted to sing. I always wanted to be a professional singer and secretly be a model. But I was always bigger. Now, I wasn't heavy. I'm the heaviest I've ever been in life now. But, you Me know, too. I was. <laughs> <laughs> I love cupcakes. What can I say? <laughs> I like food. <laughs> Just Me food. too. Food. Yeah, food. Yeah. Now, um, so I always secretly wanted to do those things, but I was shy and uh, but I just started pushing myself and making myself sing a lot more and I'm not and speaking is one of the things that I really love I love because I was always so shy growing up um 
you know, and I know that a lot of girls, us as girls, you know, we have a tendency to doubt ourselves in high school. I was just in a high school speaking, and, you know, and girls are so shy, you know, we want to fit in and we want to belong. But I tell everyone, you know, we weren't created to fit in and belong. We were created to shine as an individual. We each have our own individual DNA. So I love motivating and, and inspiring, you know, girls and women because us as girls and women, we, ha we tend to be nurturers and we've put ourselves on the back burner because number one young we want to belong we want to be liked you know and two as we get older we kind of feel like oh obligated that's what we should do you know so um that and you know i just so i'm not quite where i want to be so it is still a transition you know i always say even with the guys it just seems like they move right on into whatever it is that they're doing <laughs> 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 you know but um uh you know, I just, it's, it, it's, it's, um, you know, I think it's, it's partly me understanding and knowing how to ask, you know, and make the ask and who to ask and, and just being diligent. My thing is, I don't want to be a pest to people, but, uh, you know, I, sometimes, you know, in order to, to make things happen, you know, I can't do what I'm, I was created to do if I don't make the ask to make it happen. So that's been my lesson here. That's an excellent thing to, to remember. You know, I, am shy myself inherently and so I tend to just kind of sit back and, and see observe my scenery and then sometimes you know there's things I want to ask and I want to know but I'm just like oh what would they think of my question or they think I'm silly so um, I thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. and it's something that I can take with me and Hopefully somebody out there will take that with them sure. and they'll blossom. Well, Kim, it was such a pleasure having you. And Thank feel free you. to come back anytime yeah, to talk to us it. about sports, whatever you got going yeah. on. And we're going to talk about our show because we're going to eat Definitely. and party. Yes, we're <laughs> going to be, yes. <laughs> it's nightlife. So exactly. You stay tuned. But thank you, Kim, so thank very you. much. Such a pleasure. <laughs> All right, Mikey. Thank you. Nice I, hope you. I hope your arm is okay. <laughs> 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 My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Hey, going out like that? Yeah, why? Well, um, what would the neighbors think? <laughs> Look what I have. Mr. Bird, remember? Bark, bark, bark. We're just playing. We're just playing. I'm trying to get you out of here. Even still. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. The deceased legendary rapper Tupac Shakur was inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this past week right here in Brooklyn at the Barclays Center. Snoop Dogg, another legendary rapper, gave the honorary a tribute. When I sat down to gather my thoughts about my label mate, my homie, my brother, there's one thought I kept coming back to, that Tupac was an actual human being. Snoop said, while everyone now thinks of him as some thugged out superhero, Tupac was many things, strong and vulnerable, hard-headed and intellectual, revolutionary, and oh yeah, don't get it messed up, gangsta. Well, Mike... It's this time where we have to say goodbye to all of our friends. But you can keep up with us until we meet again next week by following us on Twitter and Instagram, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 401 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us this week, and we look forward to checking you out again next week.